The Berlin Board of Education Committed to continuous improvement May 29th Board of Education meeting as always we start with the Pledge of Allegiance so if you will stand and would the students in the front like to start for us?
back, there's an apple about halfway through that right now that's their goal, to the B to the F. questions for you. So what's your favorite thing about coding? That we get to do the buttons. Okay. And Maya, what's your favorite thing? Because um, because we get to press the buttons. <laughs> what's the hardest thing about coding? That you don't press the X. <laughs> <laughs> So, so what is the X for those people who aren't familiar with the... When the person who just did a move after you have to press the X to forget it. So it forgets its memory. Yeah, so you clear the memory. It has no brain. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and what are some of the skills, or what's a skill that we work on when we're doing that? Yeah, we took a lot of perseverance this year, didn't we? All right, thank you very much, ladies. You can so thank you to Vanessa and Maya. So we build the students' skills from there, and the stu students learn to work with more complex concepts, uh, including conditional statements and repeated patterns. So Isabel is going to demonstrate one way in which she turns some of those repeating patterns into art. Um, Isabel, would you like to just explain to everybody a little bit about what the program that we use is, and then we'll show that out. Cool that art is when you can turn your imagination into realistic art. Right, so this was the code that um, she worked on, created from scratch to uh, build an art project. And we're going to run it so you can see it run with the code. level and as you can see the amazing progress um, these students are making every day it's been great because they have gotten so much better year after year uh, I mean you see that it's just amazing coding and this is Isabel's fourth grade she's still got another year with us um, so they're doing tremendous stuff um, and they're making, um, they're learning to apply perseverance and collaborating on challenging problems. Uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I have one question. Can you come to my house and program my lawnmower? <laughs> <laughs> Did you do that? No, huh? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
that was a great presentation. We love to see what the students are doing in school. Um, <laughs> next up, bless you. Next up, we have a presentation with Uppy, Mr. Rudy. program and uh, I truly look at this program as a student-led program uh, where uh, the students around me are the ones that do uh, most of the work throughout the year with a little help from me kind of guiding them along the way so I'm gonna pass it along to them these uh, four right here are our newly selected coordinators for next year and they'll just uh, describe a little bit about what their position will entail uh, along with some <coughs> information about the year of the program uh, what the year looks like for the program, and then at the end, I'm gonna come up and kind of give you guys some, some numbers to represent what the amount of work that these students uh, have done throughout the year. Uh, so I will pass it to them. There you go. Hi, I'm Christian Damiana. Um, I'm Maya Patel. I'm Aiden Rich. I'm Simone Patel. Uh, so, we're going to get started. So, what is Uppy? It's something a lot of us are asked a lot. It's a program that's 30 years old this year. Um, it's an alcohol and drug prevention program, and we work to instill in student skills um, to make good choices and to contribute to the development of uh, the community and anything else the community has, us to, has needs us to do. Uh, so within UPI, there are houses, house leaders, the coordinators, peer leaders, the senior board, and the projects that we do. So the houses are just a group of students, um, all with a main theme that complete community service projects. The house leaders are the leaders of those houses. Um, they're, the, they're all seniors. The coordinators are the senior leaders that oversee all of the program, all of, all of the programs. Uh, that the, that Upbeat does. Um, the peer leaders are all of the students that are involved in the program. Uh, the senior board are other senior members of the program who aren't either house leaders or coordinators. And then there are projects that are short, the shorthand term we use for you know community service events and uh, that all of the students are involved in. So, in Upbeat, there are the three main pillars. Integrity, leadership, and service. Integrity is kind of teaching all of the pure leaders how to be good people, you know, make their choices, um, all morality, ethical decisions. Uh, then there's leadership. Leadership, just teaching these people, all the pure leaders, how they can become a good leader um, at that time and for the rest of their life. And service kind of what they can give back to their community 
what they can, you know, uh, improve. Um, so for our peer leader structure, it starts with the coordinators, which would be the five seniors, well, four to five seniors that are selected each year, and they help run the program as a whole, and, and they work directly with Mr. Ruby. Then we have the house leaders, which are in charge of their individual houses, and there's 15 houses usually in Upbeat. Then we have the senior board members, which are all the seniors in the program that aren't necessarily house leaders or current leaders. Then there's the peer leaders, which includes every student in the program, so that include the coordinators and house leaders and senior board members. So for the coordinators, there's four to five selected each year, and they're seniors. In order to become a coordinator, we apply and interview for the position. And their responsibilities include managing the 15 houses of Upbeat, and each coordinator is usually responsible for three to four houses each, and they work closely with Mr. Ruby throughout the whole year. Uh, then we have house leaders. Usually each year there are 30 to 45 that are selected and all you need to do to become a house leader is apply for the position. And there are two to three assigned for each particular house and like I mentioned there's usually 15 each year. And their responsibilities include managing projects for 15 to 20 peer leaders that are in each of the 15 houses. And they communicate with their community contact and they plan and organize projects based around each house's mission. So each house usually has their own purpose and mission that they're working towards. Uh, then we have the senior board, which, as I mentioned before, are all the senior members of LP. Um, so this includes the seniors, house leaders, and also the coordinators. And they commit to being drug and alcohol free for the senior year by signing a contract. And they act as a positive role model for all the underclassmen in the program. Then we have the peer leaders, which are all the students. Um, there's usually 15 to 20 per house. And so this <coughs> includes the freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And in the beginning of the school year, they register for a and they're placed into a house. Their responsibilities include attending peer leader meetings, which are bi-weekly. And they also attend their peer leadership projects, which is the community service. This year we were privileged to have five great coordinators and 15 houses that did a lot of great and useful community service. So we had the pleasure of having Sarah Crabtree, Morgan O'Connor, Jimmy Christoldis, Jimmy Wadkinder, and Hedel Patel as our coordinators. And um, they really are role models for us, which is very nice as we're coming into the position. We had a lot of different houses that helped from everywhere, from the elementary schools to the middle school to even the food pantry and a hospital that is local. Every year we have a few major annual projects that really help Upbeat connect with the community. Some of these include the Pancake Breakfast, which acts as an annual fundraiser, helping out at the Berlin Fair with a variety of different booths for different organizations in the community, helping with the Kiwanis and Christmas tree sales to make sure that um, the Kiwanis can sell them very easily, and the Upbeat Picnic, which is actually happening this week, Thursday, May 31st, at 5 o'clock until 8. So that'll be a great way for the Upbeat program to connect with the community and the younger members of it and have a lot of fun. Throughout the year we have done a lot of great projects that include drop-ins at the middle school, game nights, trunk or treat sale um, projects, and helping out at the hospital for special care. At our bi-weekly peer leader meetings we have very good attendance, and we work really hard to work on a variety of different skills that include project planning and what it means to execute a community service project, as well as drug and alcohol prevention and how to make sure that we are going to say no to drugs and alcohol and remain um, substance free for our high school careers. So now we come to the workshops and weekends. These, these are personally my favorite part of Upbeat because I see these as kind of like the reward of Upbeat. So first thing we have off at the beginning of the year is the September weekend, and that occurs at Pistol Creek. It's a day long, and we focus on leadership development. Since this is mainly focused towards juniors and seniors, we help them develop as leaders since they're going to be um, house members and house leaders. Uh, project planning, we help them plan projects um, for their houses. And then uh, planning of peer leader meetings, so each peer leader meeting 
um, our house runs it, and at this September, or yeah, at this September workshop, they choose which meeting they want to run. So after this is the October weekend. This occurs at Camp Woodstock, and this is mainly for focused towards the freshmen and sophomores. This is more to encourage them to continue upbeat and see what upbeat has in store for them. So on this weekend, we focus on team building, you know, how to cooperate with your team and how to solve a problem like effectively. Uh, multiple grade bonding, this is just so um, they can connect with other grades which they can't really experience in like a regular school setting. Um, and then we have project planning. This is usually an appreciation project. So like an example would be an appreciation project for the janitors or for the McGee staff. Um, after this is March weekend, and this is focused more towards uh, public speaking. So um, in order to help with public speaking, on Saturday there's a speech, there's an improvised speech. It depends on what grade level they are. They either deliver a one minute, um, a minute and a half, or a two minute speech, all completely improvised. Um, then we have the elementary lesson plans. So this is teaching um, fifth graders how to like um, build friendships and prioritize. And resistance education, that's kind of like the overall theme. We focus on drug and alcohol prevention throughout the entire March weekend. And after this is the May weekend. Uh, we focus on team building skills. So like, like I mentioned before, how to, um, how to like build with the team and like cooperate with them. Uh, the low ropes course, so on Saturday we go out and we participate in a challenge course. Um, there's things like rock building and that really require teamwork. And then the senior transition, at the end of the weekend the seniors say their goodbyes and kind of hand off the torch to the our juniors. So far this year we have 287 active upbeat members. That's a very good number and what that basically means is that there are 287 registered upbeat students that have completed five community service projects and attended at least five community service meetings. This is a very good number and we're hoping to see it grow in the future. We have also completed around 4,700 hours of community service and we're hoping to reach the 5,000 mark by the end of the year. That is a really great number that I think is a testament to our ability to interact with the community and really step out and show our ability to serve others in a great way. We have also completed 332 individual <coughs> service projects. So while the amount of hours is important, we also have great diversity in the amount of people we're helping and the ways we're contributing to the community. So for this year, we have our own coordinator personal goals for the 2018 and 2019 school year. So first off, we want to refocus on drug and alcohol prevention because we really do believe that it is an important thing at the high school level and something we need to make sure we discuss actively. Um, our second goal is increased appreciation for upbeat. So what we mean by this is increasing the active amount of students in the program and encourage more underclassmen to come to the meetings, sign up for projects, and make sure they like want to, so they're excited to sign up for these projects and help the community out. And our third goal is kind of to reach out to the community more um, while we did have 332 projects that did benefit the community, we do think there is more that we could do. We could reach out to more uh, organizations and help them out. So do we have any questions? Why is there a beaver on the screen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So every year, the um, incoming coordinators pick a mascot or a bunch of mascots that want to we choose will, that will represent who we are going to be as coordinators and the type of coordinators we want to be. So this year, we settled on beavers because we thought that they really work together in teams to build a home. And that was something that we really enjoyed and thought was a good metaphor for what we want our senior year to be. Does anyone have any questions for these uh, four students up here um, regarding upbeat? No. Um, I think I think they forgot to mention. Uh, we have a fifth coordinator, uh, Nicole Pinto. Uh, she wasn't able to make it tonight uh, for some other um, commitments and stuff like that. So 
Before we kind of wrap up, I did want to go over some of the data. I think it does represent um, a, a lot of what these students do throughout the year. Um, so as they kind of mentioned, each house generally has 15 to 20 kids. So at registration in the beginning of the year, um, this was kind of our, our breakdown. We had 342 high school students uh, sign up to be a part of Upbeat. <coughs> um, that is 38% of the high school student body, um, which is incredibly impressive. Um, as kind of talking with a lot of students, uh, Upbeat isn't um, necessarily for everyone. Uh, we open our doors, we accept, you know, and uh, allow everyone and try and give them an opportunity. But sometimes it's not kind of uh, a place for them. Um, so throughout the year, the numbers do kind of start to decrease. Uh, so what Christian said earlier with the 287, those 287 students are the students that contributed to those 4,700 hours of service. Um, not all of them have that five, five hours and uh, five meetings, um, but we have 200 students that have done five or more hours, and then we, got, we have just under 200 students that have actually been to seven or more meetings. So it's still a large number, a third of the registration uh, about, so that's, a, I would say, active members. We have a little over 200, um, which is still uh, about, you know, I think 25, a little, a little bit more than 25% of the student body. Um, is actively involved in Upbeat. Um, also, yeah, this is a the, this number interested me this year. Um, last year was my first year, and I tried to come up with a system to track all of these five thousand hours that these kids did, and I kind of fell short on them last year, keeping track of everything. Uh, so this year was a big push for me to make sure to keep track of. So I was able to keep track of every, everyone's hours, literally to the decimal point. Um, so the five coordinators. Uh, that I have this year. They have an average of 66 hours of community service so far this year. Um, so each of those students does that. That doesn't count their meetings with me, they're working with their house leaders, they're communicating, all the extra stuff other than just their community service hours. Um, the senior house leaders have an average of about 31 hours. Uh, the senior members have an average of about 15. Juniors are about 15, sophomores 13, and freshmen 10. So, of those, um, each grade that's involved, they have an average number of hours, which I think is very impressive um, for the freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. And then coming in and taking on a leadership role, I think a lot of those uh, students do step up and um, kind of take on some, some, more, some more hours and some more expectations. So it's definitely very impressive. Um, so 332 projects. Uh, this averages out to be about 1, 1.2 projects a day. Um, from the start of the school year till now, not every day there's been a project. Some days there's six or seven, and some there's none. Um, but the students really do an incredible, and they've done a project on every single day of the week. If you look, Friday is one of the busier days. So these students commit their Friday afternoons, their Friday evenings, to getting back to the community. Um, so I think that's a huge testament to um, these students and their commitment to the program, um, and then what kind of this program has developed in this town. And then, um, and then uh, meeting attendance. So we meet every two weeks, and um, of our 200 to 300 members, we have an average number of uh, 152 students um, every other Monday coming back to the high school at 5.30 um, to meet, to talk about what's coming up and stuff like that. Um, so I, I think that that's a very impressive number. Um, everyone's busy. These kids have musicals, plays, AP classes, uh, athletic sports. And for them to you know, get out of a practice or get out of a musical or a rehearsal and say, you know, I'm really tired, but instead of going home, I'm going to make my way to the upbeat meeting just so I know what's coming up um, is, is impressive. Um, there were some, a couple low days, and those were you know, due to bad weather and, and stuff like that. So we average out uh, about one, 150 consistent attendance. So I think that's pretty impressive. Um, that's, that's pretty much it uh, regarding kind of the, the numbers. Um, if you have any questions about it for people in the audience, if there's something um, in your school or your community or your church or anywhere that, that you would like some positive students to help out with, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can find me at jrudy at Um and you know these students would love to, to kind of help out um, where where they're needed. Any 
Quite, yeah. Well, just first of all, thank you very much for sharing all this with us, and of course your service to the community and the schools. I mean, this is amazing, and thank you, Jack, for running this amazing program. Um, my other question was just, I mean, first of all, I mean, staggering success and the amount of um, you know, students involved in this. How do you go about recruiting new students to the high school, and how do they go about figuring out which house is right for them? You guys like step for that? Yeah. <laughs> so, at the beginning of the year, um, we have every senior knows their part in upbeat. So, we know that we're the coordinators. Um, the, by the end of the year, the seniors will know uh, their house that either they're a house leader in or a senior board member of. Uh, so, next year, towards the beginning of the year, we have uh, kind of a little uh, showcase of all the houses that all the underclassmen will come to and they get to see exactly what each house will do um, and then they pick the top three and then the five coordinators um, will go through the, all of the uh, choices they have and then we'll pick um, and try to keep it under 20 per house. I think in addition to that what helps kids be interested in joining Upbeat is definitely the, the face time that the high school students have at the elementary schools and the middle schools um, with the drop-ins and um, being peer mentors and after school tutors at the elementary schools and everything. Um, I was, I, I grew up in Berlin, I went through Berlin and I remember in fifth grade when the Upbeat kids came in and did the fifth grade lesson and was like, that's really cool, that's something I want to do, and then going into uh, high school. So I think the fact that almost every student in the Berlin school system has face time with Upbeat, with the Upbeat picnic, with the peer leaders, um, is definitely a, a great recruiting tool. Um, but their enthusiasm and their presence in the school um, is, a, is another recru recruiting tool. You, we have a, a third of the athletes during the spring sport are Upbeat members. Um, I'd probably say half of the band are Upbeat members. Um, so we have students represented in many aspects of the school community, and I think that helps us to recruit. Free pizza doesn't hurt either. Yeah, free pizza's on Monday. Night. We order 25 large, large cheese pizzas, and they are gone every Monday night. <laughs> so, Bill's likes us. Bill's pizza. So, any other questions? If I could just add that uh, Jack Rudy took over the Upbeat program from Alice Mitchell. Jack was a former member of Upbeat. And Jack, in my opinion, has done an outstanding job of moving the program forward and growing it from there. Jack would never share that with the board, but I think it's important that you know that. Thank Jack's you. involvement is great within the community, as well as at the high school. I know us from students, you can find Mr. Rudy all day long, right? If you want to get the upbeat. Except when I close the upbeat. And the weekend, <laughs> I, except when he closes the upbeat, when I hear there's a lot of disappointment when yeah. you do that. So he's like, but, you know, Jack, I just want to commend you for the job you've done and taking over and moving the program forward. A lot of new thoughts, a lot of new ideas moving forward, and uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we have some special recognition. We have some art awards. Brian? Sure. Um, each year for the last six or seven years, we've had a Berlin art show at the New Britain Art Museum. And in this last year with budgetary cuts, we had a K-12 art coordinator who would coordinate the show and kind of put all the pieces together. This year, I want to commend the teachers for kind of pulling it together, as well as pulling me in and my assistant to try to make it uh, take place. And I think that it was a great show still, and we were able to still showcase our students' work. So. We'd like to give a little recognition to those students tonight. Um, I, um, the first recognition I'd like to give, um, we started three years ago having the administrators, superintendent, assistant superintendent, as well as the principals pick a piece of artwork from the show as kind of like the selection. Um, and this year I was very proud of what I selected because I got a phone call from Ms. Miller at the high school saying, would you mind if you didn't get the original because someone wanted to buy it? And I said, of course not. I said, so I said, well, I must have a real good eye for art because when I selected, someone else wanted to buy it. So if I could ask um, Jake Fisher from the board, to, and as well as Nancy, I want to say the name right, Ingenito. I said, hey, please come forward if I could show your artwork, if you could show your artwork. And Share a little about it, what made you, what kind of painting it is, and sure. 
second major thing. Okay, so basically our assignment was to go out into the world and take a picture of the landscape anywhere where you wanted to. So I just did it in Berlin somewhere, and it's watercolor. And we had to use different techniques basically, so like the, tr the like trees are with sponges and then the grass type straw is made with like cardboard, so I just like stapled it on. And then the little dots, you put like some glue on it, so you can go over it, and then you can just rub it off. And then the sky is just like an ombre effect that I did. And yeah. <laughs> as well as our elementary principals, Mr. Sousa, Dr. Correa. I think Mrs. Soroyce is representing Mr. Griswold. Mr. Soroyce, no, Mr. Kitsman's out today six, and Mrs. Soroyce, if you would step in as the assistant principal of Griswold. <laughs> What's up? Do you want to call the stand? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate all of our young artists that are receiving awards this evening. Excellent job, well done. And just a, a quick plug for the Willard uh, student presenters. That was amazing. So some great stuff going on. Congratulations and such a job well done. Thank you to the upbeat uh, students as well for a very informative presentation. Um, if I could have Lila or Cooper come up here. Lila's looking as beautiful as this, as this chalk pastel in watercolor, as a professional would call it. I'd like to welcome Lila's family, and I'd like to thank Mrs. Larch and uh, Mrs. Vernon and Ms. Monzowski for being here as well, Ms. Watson. Um, Lila was a grade one student at, at Hubbard School, and when we came and had to judge the, uh, the artwork, um, to full disclosure, if this doesn't represent the beauty, innocence, simplicity, elegance of elementary artwork, I don't know what does. I would definitely take this penguin home. It's absolutely, uh, it's absolutely stunning. That's why I, I chose it. You just feel good looking at it. Um, and uh, if, so, congratulations, Lila, for such a, a job well done with this and an excellent work. And I'm sure somebody would want to buy this as well. And uh, I just want to just the, the teacher who inspired this, uh, Miss Monzuski, works with our K and first grade students at Hubbard. So I just want to thank her for her commitment, for her talents, for her expertise. You're going to be sorely missed next year. Um, and I just want to commend you for what you brought to our district for this year and, and what you've done with the, with the students and that shows in, in Lila's work here. So, Lila, do you want to say anything about this wonderful piece of art? Did you know? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, congratulations. Lila. And as we all know from going to the show, there's a lot of great pieces of art, but sometimes there's that one that just catches your eye and instantly inspires you a little bit. So I'd like to bring up Julie McClure. I don't want to go. Don't worry, my 
here. Well, I'm going to share what I loved about your piece. I love the colors. I love the fish. And then I love this little, it almost looks like a spaceship, but that reminded me of a submarine as well. And then I thought to myself, it could be anything that you want it to be. And I instantly, when I saw this picture, kept thinking to myself, boy, I would love to be in here and going around and seeing all these beautiful colored fish. It's a scuba diver. A scuba diver, okay. Well, <laughs> again, I thought, my dear, it could be a lot of different things. It inspired us. Um, Mrs. Vernon, you you loved the choice as well. You, yes. And, and Angelina worked really hard on it too and did a great job. We're very proud of you. So we're going to have this frame. It'll be hanging at Willard. And what we do is we hang it for a year and then we give it back to you so the family can have it, even though I'd like to buy it. But I will return it to you. And we're just so proud of you. So when your classmates and all your peers at Willard are in the hallways, they're going to see this hung outside Mrs. Vernon's door. So congratulations to you. You're a great artist. On behalf of Griswold School um, and Mr. Kitzman, we'd like to present his selection. Yeah. I'm going to ask Mrs. Modulewski to talk about the assignment, and then we're going to call up our great artist. So this is uh, Sadell Holland from third grade. It was radial weaving. They had previously learned the under-over weaving patterns with paper, um, going more just in straight rows. So we built upon that, and it became radial weaving, going around and around. And they learned about loom and warp and weft and all that great terminology for the art room and um, practiced all different weaving patterns of going over one under one or over two under one. Um, and Sadell did a beautiful, beautiful job talking about symmetry and reading of symmetry. She worked very, very hard and she also was a great helper with her other peers in the class too. Sadell, come on up. We're going to tell you what Mr. Kitzman loved about this. Say. What Mr. Kitzman had told me was the pop of color. Those beautiful, vibrant colors stood out to him. The dimensions, and it was obvious that you put a lot of time and effort into this. You created a magnificent piece. So very well done. Congratulations. Thank you all very much for all your time and effort. Thank you for giving us a chance to present. Thank you. Thank you. Just a little note. I know that if that's going to be next meeting because they only have to make it. Okay. Um, a little bit about the art program here and the budget. I have to use this as part of the budget. Last year, the art position at um, Hubbard School was a part-time position. We eliminated that position to meet the budget constraints. This year, because of the budget constraints, we are eliminating our position at the high school, which is why Rose's position at Griswold was being, Rose will not have a job next year because the art teacher from the high school will be moving to the elementary because of seniority. Um, you know, so when you hear about the budget and what's going on, there are cuts being made to the budget, and these are some of the positions that, that we're losing, as well as, as I said, for years we had a K-12 <coughs> coordinator that looked at art as a K-12 curriculum articulation as well as art around town, as well as putting together the art show, as well as putting together professional development. That position was eliminated last year. And that is not in the budget again for this year. So um, there are some real constraints that we're under with the budget. So, But I appreciate all your efforts. Thank you very much, Rose. You've done an outstanding job for Borough Public Schools, so thank you. Before moving to the next section of our agenda, we'll take a brief recess for those that don't want to stay for the rest of our meeting. I can't believe that would be, but um, there's uh, cookies over here. Please help yourself, um, because otherwise Rich has to eat them all. <laughs> we'll take a brief recess, about five minutes. We are back. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Next item on the agenda are committee reports, correspondence to the board. We will start with a report from our student representative. Right, well, Alex, you're on. First off, excuse my congested voice. Uh, calling the end of that but um, it's pretty evident that the school year is winding down. That's noticeable by the lack of seniors in class. They take their skip days and the teachers who are trying to either cram in or take their foot off the gas pedal. So Wait, we give skip days? We don't, but they, <laughs> they do. Yeah. It must be the pollen. <laughs> yeah, they're sick. Let's go with that. Um, so with that comes the academic achievements that are being recognized. We have our award ceremony tomorrow at 7 o'clock in the auditorium. And uh, the senior salutatorian and valedictorian were honored last month. That's Ashley Bryant and Sarah Giovanni. So congratulations to them. I know how much hard work that takes. It's, it's tough to stay competitive up, up at the top. Um, and our spring, our spring sports teams are uh, they're having a lot of success this year. We have both boys baseball and girls softball made the playoffs. They, uh, they played today. Boys lacrosse plays East Lime tomorrow. And uh, both guys and girls track are competing in states and hopefully state opens, depending on the results of the state meets. And then another upcoming important competition is Mr. BHS, and where uh, the jokesters of the senior <laughs> class are going to compete for that uh, cash prize and crown title of Mr. BHS. So looking forward to that. That's Sunday in the auditorium. Are you competing? I'm not. I'm Is a junior. Maybe next year. <laughs> oh, that's right. You're a junior. I just did the same thing. Yeah, and that's all I got. Okay. Hey, Alex, thank you. Congratulations on a good, strong school year for you. Thank you. Correspondence to the board? Just a few notes to the board. Um, dear Brian and BOE, I want to thank you so much for keeping me and my family in your thoughts during this difficult time. Okay, it was absolutely beautiful. Finally, Vicky Muggleston, his father passed away. Uh, I would tell my dear another uh, thank you note. I would tell my dear father about the wonderful people in the Berlin public school system. Thank you for your thoughtfulness. Finally, Helen Hastings. Um, Helen also um, lost her parent, one of her parents. And then I have one letter of resignation. Um, dear Kate, please accept this notice as my resignation from the Berlin Board of Education, BOE Effective Estate, uh, which is May 22nd, 2018. I've enjoyed serving as elected board member for the past six years and wish to BOE and Berlin Public Schools in the town of Berlin good fortune going forward. Respectfully submitted, Jeffrey Cugno. Jeff is in the audience, so Jeff, on behalf of the Board of Education, we thank you very much for the service. And sit tight, there's more to come. Um, anything else from the correspondence to the Board? That's it. All right. Next up, we have the audience of citizens. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to address the Board of Education? Mr. Richards. Who would you like to start? Right there is fine. Okay. Good evening, my name is John Richards. I live at 239 Hawthorne Drive. I uh, carry two other titles that may be appropriate for tonight. One is Board of Finance member elected and Board of Ed Liaison from the Board of Finance. I'm standing before you tonight I'm not, to, uh, not to dictate, but to try to help to influence where we're headed. I believe at 9.30 this morning, uh, Mr. Tendy may have spoken with the chair of the Board of Finance at least that's what I was told. But I do know that I sent an email to the chair of the ERC, copy to you, and copy to the superintendent. Uh, the Board of Finance is meeting currently upstairs. And I was hoping, in terms of influence, would be to say uh, what information might be able to be shared with them. You have your meeting here with uh, Cameron. We have some press, I believe, upstairs and trying to understand what the impact may be. So let me try to stay as close as I can to facts. Uh, fact number one is that the failure of the second referendum has the Board of Finance crafting a revised budget to be submitted to the Town Council. I have not been upstairs for tonight's discussion, but I was present at the last discussion, and the suggestion from the Board of Finance, because we're not getting any uh, guidance from the town council is that our read on what the town is telling us is zero mil. We tried to go with something uh, closer to 1.67 and negotiate other other values, but that was not acceptable to the council and was deemed no too high. 
I was at a council meeting where I asked if it was no too high, I'd like to be Goldilocks, what's just right? And, and we've got nothing. So this is, that's where the Board of Finance is headed. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the budget at the second referendum was just under a mil, 0 0.95, 0 0.96, something of that nature. So that's what's been going on. So my concern is that as this meeting goes forward upstairs, and this meeting goes forward downstairs, we may have uh, missed an opportunity to understand what the Board of Ed's intentions will be. Do you have it on your agenda for later? I had asked for it to be moved up so I might be able to hear it, so I could take it upstairs, but we, we haven't gotten to that point. It could be that the email uh, didn't get as, around as quickly as I thought it would. But the next step would be that there's a public hearing that's scheduled for Monday the 4th. It would be sponsored is the wrong idea, I guess, but that's what the Board of Finance would like to do. And I'd like the concept to be thought of as what was done before the first referendum. Here's the Board of Finance proposed budget, because we have to pass it to the Council. What does it mean? And there were presentations by both the Town and the Board of Ed, and we would hope that that would be similar on the force so that people would understand that. Uh, in particular, since referendum number two, had 250000 as a reduction to the Board of Ed's budget, I'm not sure if you're prepared to share what that impact would be. But with the failure of it, it's probably that and additional. I, I don't know how to read the mayor who says that he wants to do modest cuts, no layoffs, no losses of services. I think we're perilously close to that, at least on the Board of Ed side. I, I can't speak perfectly for the town. So, I'll, uh, I'll be here and stay here until AD if that's when that discussion will happen. And hopefully we'll have something that could be taken to, if not tonight, shared with the Board of Finance as to where we may be headed and what the impact is so the community would know. And I thank you for your time. Thanks, John. Uh couple of things I'll just address that you, you outlined is I did indeed have a conversation with uh, the Board of Finance Chair this morning at 9.30 as I was driving to Rhode Island for a meeting that I had. Um, I haven't seen your, your email uh, yet simply because uh, I haven't had an opportunity to read it and, and I'll tell you why is because I had to drive to Rhode Island and, and I'm not being sarcastic it's just um, I kind of came back, changed my clothes and then came here, so I haven't had a chance to catch up with that. So sometimes when emails happen in the same day, um, as you know, because you, it's the same for you, is we have real regular jobs, and this is also, you know, we do this in our spare time because we don't have anything else to do. Um, so I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but I know that there's a whole lot of other people who run around thinking that we don't have anything else to do other than, and then this business, and this business is very important. Um, I will look for a motion to move the discussion about budget up in the agenda I, but imagine there's some people that are very interested in that conversation um, but we have forwarded the letter that we sent to the mayor prior to um, when we send it prior to the first to second uh, prior to the second referendum um, which outlined those areas that we would be looking at first um, I think it's fair to say that we can go on the record to say what they are since it's in that, that letter. And so those items that we're looking at first, this is with a $250,000 cut, um, would be, uh, you know, we've heard it before, but you know, middle school sports, I mean, we can tell you that that's worth about $100,000. Um, we put into the budget the concept of um, a safety coordinator for next year. We feel that that's very important, but because it's an un- it's, it's a position that's not in our structure today. We would have a conversation about whether we want to move forward with that. Um, the ESS program and, and the viability of that, whether we can keep that going or not, we put that in the budget this year as opposed to um, having it hopefully being able to pay for with funds at the end of the year. Uh, this is we're, in our, we're entering our third year of that. We feel it should be a budgeted item, not just something we hope we can continue. Um, we talked about music and art at the elementary schools. We just had a presentation by the artists in our schools, and you can see how that impact already is affecting the students. Um, you know, we lost our, our, our coordinator last year. We lost our, an art teacher 
Last year we're losing another one. This year, uh, Brian, what else was in that the letter that we sent up? Um, we talked about to implementing to fees. Yes, Do you want to move to have this discussion? No, I just want him to know because okay. the, co the conversation then is going to change directions. Okay. No, implementing fees um, and things of that. There are other things in that letter, but that's where we are. So if that's enough for you to go back with, that's fine. But that's audience of citizens at this point. I just wanted to address those items so that I know that you're looking for that. Okay. You have a good point because my tail end of the day was just as bad. From 4.30 until 7, I was on the road from Danbury to Litchfield to Waterbury to here. So if something did come back in that time, uh, my apologies that, that I haven't seen anything since yeah, 4.30. It, did. I, it didn't. Uh, right. it, well, the letter went to Sam. So. Okay. So th the notion of the discussion, and, and certainly what I want to be careful with is, is that the Board of Finance is not the mouthpiece for the Board of Ed. That, that okay. shouldn't be the case. And, and we don't want them to be. Some of these things had been shared via the press. Correct. So that's, that's really the point, would be to say that the, if the Board of Ed says these things, and, and you have tonight, or the yes. letter does, uh, that will be helpful because we don't really want to be uh, advocating is one thing, but speaking on behalf of is something uh, else. Understood. Thank you. Um, so, uh, with that said, I'm going to. Is there anybody else who would like to address the Board of Education in Audience of Citizens? All right, so I'm going to close Audience of Citizens. Now we'll move on to the agenda. We'd like to move that conversation up in the move item. I believe it's 8 <coughs> E up in the agenda and have that conversation now. <coughs> Hearing no motion. I mean, for, for sake of organization, I guess I would move to um, re-alphabetize section 8 placing the discussion regarding the 2018-2019 budget item E as item A in section 8. I think item 6 and item 7 we can get through fairly quickly. Uh, and possibly even for the posterity of um, Mr. Selena and Ms. Sisti making it item B if we wanted to move it up. I think we can get to that one pretty quick, too. Make a motion, and we'll see if we get a second. All right, so let me try that again. I move to amend Section 8, New Business, placing item current item E in between current item A and current item B. So for Second. organization, we'll call it A1. I have a motion by Tim. Second. Second by Rich. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right, so we will move it up. So we will go, we'll follow our agenda, but we will move it up in order to be a little more perfect here. So. Item number six, we have uh, personnel. We have an anticipated appointment for the Director of Business Operations. Um, we've gone through a number of interviews. Actually, when we say it, rephrase this is, Mr. Benigni has gone through a number of interviews to get us to this point. Uh, the board interviewed his final candidate um, earlier this evening. And I will entertain a motion to appoint Mr. Kugno as our new Director of Business Operations. It was in our packet. I have it here. Mm -hmm. You have it, I'll Rich? make a motion. I move that the Board of Education appoint Jeffrey P. Kugno to the position of Director of Business Operations, effective July 1st, 2018. I have a motion by Rich. Second. Second by Carrie. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 6 0. Congratulations, Mr. Kogo. We look forward to July 1st with huge anticipation what you're going to bring there. So, 
Congratulations. <clears throat> Next up we have the consent agenda. Would anyone like to add or remove anything from the consent agenda? Seeing nothing, I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Motion by Carrie. Second. Second by Rich. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 6-0. And we will now move to new business. We have the appointment of new board members. On April 10th, 20, 2018, board member Frederick Morley Jr. submitted his letter of resignation from the Board of Education. Mr. Morley was serving a one-year term on the board from November 2017 to November 2018. On May 22nd, 2018, board member Jeffrey Cugno submitted his letter of resignation from the Board of Education. Mr. Cugno was serving a three-year term from 2015 to 2018. The board solicited and selected new members from interested residents who were interviewed on May 21st. I can tell you there was 18 of them, started at five, ended at almost Ten. midnight. Um, the, new, the new members will serve until the next election. Um, with that, I'll entertain a motion. I move to appoint Adam Salina and Tracy Sisti to fill the vacancies on the Board of Education until the next election. Okay. I have a motion by Carrie, second by Jamie. Conversation, discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Congratulations, Tracy. Congratulations, Adam. We look forward to you serving with us. Um, your next step is to see Kate at the town hall, get sworn in. And Brian, you better get their name plates made. I'll make sure they're here <laughs> for the next board meeting. Congratulations. We look forward to working with you. <coughs> The car wash starts on Thursdays. <laughs> okay, so now we will go to item A1, which is a discussion regarding the 2018-19 budget. So, two failed referendums. We already have a $250,000 uh, reduction. Um, and I've heard numbers as high as an additional 300000 dollar um, reduction and we all know that we put forth a 1.99 percent budget which really didn't leave room for any of these reductions um, honestly for for a few reasons one is transparency right we want to be upfront and honest with what with where our budget and to be perfectly frank what I learned is probably shouldn't have done that um, Number two is there's also clearly there are some some misnomers about what is in our budget and what we can and can't do. Um, Brian, our big concern now is is at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We've already talked about, as I just spoke about earlier, areas that that we're looking at first. We feel that those would have the least impact relative to academics, even though they are significant to the education that our students. Have and, the, and the support structure that they get. Um, what happens, in your opinion, I mean, you're intimately close with the budget, with another $300,000 reduction? It'll be programs and services, there's no doubt. Um, certain programs will not be able to operate at the same level or at all. Class sizes as we know them will not remain the same. Um, I think there's a concern that we have always had favorable class sizes. And we've been able to run the courses that have a very competitive high school and then the courses that we can offer. Um, we did take a hard look already at courses that had enrollment below 10 and you know, hence we eliminated two positions at the high school because of that. So there really isn't that room to go further. It will definitely impact programs and services. So whether you're looking at uh, middle school sports, which is you know, a program, or you're looking at elimination of freshman sports, um, I believe our job is to protect instructional core um, and look at what we can do to keep that. Um, as I said tonight, we have been doing our own reductions over the last two years, such as 
a half-time art position <coughs> last year, a full-time art position this year. Um, so I think the magnitude of the cuts will be a direct correlation to how many dollars get cut. You know, if it is 300000 plus to 250, or if it is a zero, the magnitude of a zero would take us years to recover from. And there would definitely be a different school district looking at a cut of $860,000. At that tube, that 1.99%. There, there is not, you know, there's just, we've tried to be lean coming in and you know that typical mark that we've had for the last five years is one percent, one point two, one point three. We were at one point nine, which was maybe you know two tenths, three tenths higher than, than typical, but not within the range of the ones is what we've had for the last five years. But you know, sustaining a one is not moving us ahead. It's only trying to hold on. So. Ever question. Um, not too long ago, we were talking about technical education courses, which are electives. And we're obviously already in a position where we can't offer these when they have very low enrollment, single digits. Um, is it safe to assume with additional cuts, we may not be able to offer them at all, or at least some of them? We'd go back again. So the first cut was, and it really came out of criticism of the program of studies, saying, you know, you have courses and people ask for copies of the program, so you have courses running with low numbers, and that was the first criticism. So looking at those numbers, saying, okay, you know, where are they low, and then deciding that there were two positions we could cut because of low enrollment. The next step would be to go back and say, okay, we're not running courses the first time with single digits, well, maybe we're not running courses with 13 students or 14 students because of, we need to get another three teachers cut. Or do we say at the elementary level, we're going to take the class size for third grade is 20. It's now going to be 25 because we're going to shut down a third grade teacher. And now, you know, the other class of 20 now pushes out the other classes, and now there's 25 in every class. Those are the type of cuts that would have to take place, or they're total programmatic cuts. Um, in years past, um, elimination of freshman sports. There's high schools that have done that um, around us, reducing schedules. Eliminating elimination of middle school sports. Um, where we go with it, I mean, it's a decision discussion with the board, but I think it's really, as I said before, how much are we at being asked to cut? And I still think the premise, how can we protect the instructional core? And that does not mean that I'm saying that AP courses can't get cut, because if the enrollment is that low, it would impact AP courses. and. It has an impact the elementary. We haven't eliminated teachers. We kept class sizes consistent, but a drastic cut here would have to because we've already <laughs> really leaned out the high school as far as the, the number of students in the courses. So I think that le leads to, to this, and I think it's what Mr. Richards was referring to earlier, is both the, the town council and some members of the Board of Finance are asking us specifically what we are going to cut with this amount of money. And it's not an answer that we can give easily because we need to know what the dollar value is so then we can weigh that against what do we keep, what do we keep within the core. And then you kind of, so, you know, we've used this analogy before, if you kind of look at a bullseye, is, what do we keep in the center? And then you have the rings that build on the outside. Actually, I think that that came from uh, Mr. Richards at one point um, in another meeting. But without knowing where the Board of Finance or the Town Council is going to end up, we can't answer that easily. Uh, because it's a, it's a fluid budget that we have 2,700 students that we want to make sure that we can still provide the best education to that, that we can. The, the issue now is, and Brian referred to it, is a, after a number of years now, and if, if you used any of the data that we provided in previous meetings, if you look at 1.3, 1.5, 1.7, you know, 1.4 over a number of years, that doesn't allow us to, to grow any of our programming. It just allows us to 
keep going. But what's happening behind the scenes is its support is actually being eroded. When you take away administration or leadership or team leaders or other support, that erodes what's available to the students. It doesn't look like it on the surface when you're looking at it from 5,000 feet, but the reality is it's pulling away the support that we can give to those students. Um, and now we're at kind of the critical point that um, we, those resources that are, quote, behind the scenes, or in my business we call kind of below the line, um, we've used those. So uh, now, to Brian's point, more cuts or more reductions to what our request was is going to have a much bigger and probably more visible impact than we really want to, at least we want to stomach. It's for us to sit here to ask, you know, Brian to make these these recommendations is very difficult. Um, I know that we've, Jake, you've done some work on, on fees. Um, you know, we've talked about implementing parking fees at the high school. There's a lot of high schools that do that, charge a fee for, for students to park. Um, <coughs> our initial conversation is we didn't really want to look at that, but the reality is, is we may need to. Um, we've talked about pay to participate in sports and extracurriculars. You know, the offset to a reduction is to try to bring revenues in. We just see that as <coughs> charging, you know, it's essentially you're, you're, you're charging the students to, to do what they should be able to do anyway. I mean, it's, a, it's an education system that should be all-encompassing. But we're now in a very difficult position because um, we have, uh, you know, leadership right now that, you know, I'll say it is, does not seem to want to support education. I'm not afraid to say it. Thoughts from the board? I would just say, I don't know, it looked like you were going to say something, I didn't want to catch up. Um, there seems to be this misleading perception up out there that just tell us how much we can cut without it actually affecting the kids. And the answer is nothing. There is, we've already cut, it's already, the budget is already sliced to the bone. Anything that gets cut is going to the elimination of programs or people at this level, whether it's a stipend position or programs that, that impact a handful of kids. Matt, you mentioned ESS, you mentioned the potential safety officer. There's so many things on here, and they're all priorities. Nobody wants to get rid of any of these things. But the fact is, we can't lose more money and still maintain the current services that we're doing. I think the, the other thing to consider that we, we have in the past and we will continue to going forward is the the ancillary costs to the changes that we make. <clears throat> when teachers are let go, you've got unemployment costs and other unexpected, unplanned, but expected things that happen. So those numbers all just kind of pile on to these adjustments. And depending on the scope of that number, Brian's office will factor in that impact, right? One change here versus three changes here may be the same. And depending on what the number is, so to your point of making it hard to figure out what is that specific item. And I had heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brian. <clears throat> generally speaking, for every person that is released, you're only saving about half the salary based on all the money you have to set aside for unemployment and everything else. Yeah, it's somewhere between a half and a third. But I think the other thing to recognize is that the cuts that have previously been made are to administration, teaching staff, paraprofessionals, secretaries, custodians, custodians, those cuts were already made with the first million dollars that was cut. And that was coming into the initial budget proposal of 1.99. So those areas have been looked at already in, in, in cuts being made. The, the other aspect that I think is important to look at is um, when we look to go further with cuts, we've tried our best to maintain the art show still took place. Yes, we had half or less art teacher, it still took place, there was no coordination. So we've tried, because that's what we do, to try to maintain the services. 
but at some point those services just no longer hold. <coughs> um, the elementary staff had time to collaborate at each grade level to make for a much tighter curriculum, much greater professional development and, and new learning that takes place. We no longer have those that time because we had to cut the recess paraprofessionals. So things are changing, even if it's not seen from the outside, but it's changing even from the inside out. And eventually it will come out. And budgetary cuts of this nature, it, it has to come out because there's nowhere left to go. Um, the, the one thing I wanted to add, and I maybe mean, this is directed to, to you, Mr. Richards, is, is that, I mean, clearly, yes, the voters have spoken, and we saw what, the, what happened in the votes. But I still have to question whether or not one, it was representative. I mean, it was a very small turnout. Um, and I just really wonder if the people in the town really understood what the ask was. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, the ask on the second referendum was a 1.4% increase to the, the board budget. Um, there weren't any signs that said 1.4%. I'm not sure even if the Berlin Citizen mentioned 1.4%. Um, I know I voted and didn't even say what the budget was. It just said yes or no. So I really question if the town council really understands if the town really said we can't stomach 1.4% for our kids. Because I don't know if that's really what's the case. I just, I just want to say, first of all, I appreciate you, Mr. Richards, taking a message um, up and being willing to share some of that which is discussed here. The, um, the other piece that I would ask, and I know it's a small audience, but I would also ask that people share some of that which is, um, has been highlighted here as potential consequences of this with as many people as you can kind of reach out and touch because I think to your point, Jake, and to um, points that others have made previously, <coughs> they, there isn't a real understanding until it impacts your child, your child's classroom, your school, your, um, I don't know, your property value. Um, and that's unfortunate because it's too late then. We've already cut into the bone at that point and, um, and that's, it, as you said earlier, Brian, um, recovering from that is something that will take us a while to do. Um, and there are natural and negative consequences for the students of our town. So I think it's important that the message um, is shared about what the consequences, the potential consequences really are. And I just think the um, responsibility of looking at the budget and being responsible, when you look at the cuts that were previously made, you look at the budget summary of the line items that are increasing. There's only four line items increasing. Certified salaries, which is contractual increases. And some might say, well, you know, if we can get that number to decrease. It just means cutting teachers. Then the number decreases because there's contractual obligations. So if, if I eliminate positions, then that number also decreases. Transportation. We have transportation, you know, the restrictions on transportation. There are federal as well as state mandates of transportation needs that we have to provide. Um, and those are rising. Um, all it takes is a few students moving to the district, and you could swing $150,000 either way on transportation. And we're federally and state mandated to do provide transportation. The other area is con contracted services, which is our ESS program, which was funded with funds from insurance money that came back last year that was left this year we put it in the budget so if you eliminate our effective school solution or ESS that line doesn't increase either so when you look at the budget from a holistic point of view just look at the budget summary there's only four lines that are increasing totally in the budget so my feeling is that it was a responsible budget put forward but I don't think that really is getting factored in right now it's just being said that you know there's more that can come out of it but you know, when you look at it from that perspective, where is it coming out? And that goes back to the initial comment. It's either programs or services, right? So. Anybody like to add anything at this point? Relative to June 4th, I've already agreed that the Board of Education would be represented and that we would present 
Um, similarly to what we discussed <coughs> this evening, is these are the areas that we would look at, um, but without having a <coughs> solid number of what the reduction is, we, we can't tell you exactly what it's gonna be uh, because we have to look at the whole district overall and, and how we can, can make that work. <coughs> Um, and I think that you're well aware of that. I've heard you say things of that nature. Is, is you know, the board's not going to tell you it's this and this and this. It's not like you pick off a menu. Is we have to look at the, the entire district. So, um, anything else relative to the budget? Okay, uh, we're going to move on. We'll move on to item B, which is the summer instructional program. There, follow up to that one, ladies. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. So as we um, do every year, we just have a just a summary of where we think we're heading with summer school as we move into it for this year. This is summer school for our special education students. Um, on the front of the page, I just uh, gave an overall <coughs> summary of the dates for summer school. We have two programs. We run a four-week program that's three hours a day for three days out of the week, so a total of Actually, it comes out to 11 days due to um, July 4th. Um, that goes pre-K through um, our transition program. And then we have a five-week program at the preschool and at the elementary school for our students in our BLAST program. That goes five days a week, so it's a total of 20 hours. They actually go four hours each day. Um, and then we have listed the criteria just for summer school. Can yes. you share, Mich Michelle, a little bit about an overview of why we have the summer program and who it's servicing, just so people understand, you know, that it's not something that's, you know, we're spending additional, yes, it is additional funds, but what the need is and, and why it's taking place? Yeah, so the, I did list some of the criteria for summer school, so um, basically, and feel free to jump in, but um, <laughs> Basically, it's to um, help students maintain services, maintain skills over the course of the summer. Um, it's not to um, teach new skills, it's to maintain the skills that they've already learned. Um, and that can range from, I mean, we have some students that come for academic reasons, some students for behavioral reasons, it just the routine seems to be what they need. So we look at each, each student case by case to determine if they're eligible. So the criteria for most students is a significant regression in skills that wouldn't normally, that, that is more significant than uh, a typical student would over the summer. So we know students who don't have reading instruction over the summer may fall back a little bit if they don't do a lot of reading mm -hmm. on their own, but we're looking for a significant, um, yeah. you know, regression in skills. Also the nature and severity of a disability is the other criteria we really look at, and that's most of our students in our BLAST program that mm -hmm. would be there that really need that continuation yep. of services for them to be able to maintain their skills. So we're really looking to make sure our students don't fall too far behind so when they come back in September, we're starting all over again with skills. So we look at how students <clears throat> come back after weekends, after long weekends, after vacations, all of those pieces play factors into it. And then um, on the back <coughs> is, is where we are as of last week on the breakdown of the number of students coming in. So these were, so these mostly these are who we've recommended for the totals that we've recommended for summer school. At Some parents have had declined previously to last week, so those numbers are not included. 
Um, we still haven't, as always at this time, we haven't gotten all the responses back, so we don't have our numbers targeted in. So these numbers may change. Cindy and I were actually talking. She had gotten some different numbers just yesterday or Friday that I didn't have. So our teachers, number of teachers may also decrease for the summer. So wherever we can, we try to combine. So I'm like, I know at the elementary level, a lot of times I'm able to combine two grade levels. So I'm just waiting on the final numbers to see if I can do that. And I'm looking at the same thing. Um, I know my high school numbers are not gonna be that high. Um, getting high school students to come to extended school year is sometimes difficult and they're more reluctant to go there. So I know that number will be reduced somewhat. Um, but in there is also our transition students and our students in our life skill program. So it's not just our, um, there's three different kind of programs amongst that number that's yep. there. And the other thing we're still waiting to hear on is whether Choice is providing transportation. So we do have, um, and those students are included in the counts above, but I just wanted you to see the number of students that we are, we have recommended for summer school. Um, we had to send all of our information on all of our students on who we anticipated coming to summer school back in March and they're waiting to see if they have the funding to provide the transportation. So if they can be transported, they will be here. Um, and if not, unfortunately, they won't. Um, we went through this last summer and they were able to come through and the students were able to attend summer school. So we're hopeful that that happens again this year. And again, if that number gets reduced and they can't fund it, that'll be reflective in our staff. Yeah. They'll, they'll provide yeah. programming for them at Harvard. That's what I was going to say. Okay. Okay. If, if they're right. being recommended for summer right. school because of their individual education plan, they need to provide it. So if they don't come to us, they'll provide something. We also have um, two students who are in magnet schools who are coming to us for their summer school programming. Um, I believe they're both Hartford Magnet Schools, so their Hartford Magnet Schools are not providing summer school like they had in the past. They did it for their whole student population. Um, they aren't providing it, so they're com those students are coming to us. So the Hartford Public Schools is electing to send those students to Berlin Public Schools? They're Berlin students oh, they're who Berlin are attending students. Magnet I Schools. Yeah. I was yep. not paying attention, obviously. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So during their PPT, summer school is recommended. They didn't have a program in their school, so they'll come to us. Can I ask something? You mentioned that you said you weren't sure of the 23 high school students if you could convince them all to go. But if they're PPT'd into an additional summer program, why is there an option? Because the parents would decide. But if it was part of the PPT and therefore the IEP, does that not mandate that this is supposed to it, be? Presented? It mandates that we you know, are offering those services, the parents can opt out of that okay. if they'd like to. And that's part and sometimes of they change their mind, sometimes they're right. <laughs> they convince their parents. So we send out a, a form to families every year just asking, you know, that summer school was recommending, are you going to send the, your student? And then are you away for any of that time? Because sometimes that plays into the number of paraprofessionals we may need to hire. So that's what we're waiting for to come back. And just a point of clarification, so the regular special education summer school, did you say it's a total of 11 days? It's 11 days. Yes, so presumably there could be some families who are away for part of that and think, why Absolutely. am I sending my kid for five Absolutely. days? Right. Right. I think um, since I've been here, I've seen that decrease because parents know a lot of, now that July is when we have summer school. Right. So I've seen less of that, but it still happens. Was there ever a time in our district that that summer school was more than 11 days? I mean, speaking to the point of students losing skills, I mean, 11 days is not a lot of days. It was, right. it was 12 really? last year, but because of four Right, but I mean, was it ever a longer period? No. no. It was always um, three days. Is that, and only for the month of July. And is right. that typical of schools around mm -hmm. us? Mm -hmm. Okay. It just doesn't seem like a big difference, <laughs> right? 11 days of right. a few hours in church. Yeah, 33 hours. Any other questions? Questions? No questions? And thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going back in September. Let you know. I'm sorry. Okay, next item, naming of the B gym at Berlin High School. Brian, I'll let you talk to us about sure. this. 
Um, I received a phone call from um, Jim Arnold, one of the uh, physical education teachers and coach at the high school regarding the um, outpouring about naming of the gym after um, our late coach Jim Day and athletic director. And uh, Jim took it upon himself to solicit over 900 people to sign a petition to name the B gym after Jim Day, or Coach Day, as infectiously known. Um, the B gym after the right when the new high school, um, the B gym is where all of the wrestling took place, and that's why the thought was to name the B gym after the wrestling room with the renovation uh, at the high school no longer having the wrestling room. So um, I think by the petition you can see there's a lot of support in the community. Um, and, yeah, and beyond the community too. Um, the fact of the tournaments that go on in the gym and after high school and things that um, the gym started have kind of been you know, a legacy that will continue where we have you know, multiple towns from in-state and out-of-state coming to Berlin for wrestling. I think it's impressive that they have over 900 signatures. Who who obtained all these signatures? Jim Arnold headed up the signatures. That's I can't incredible. tell you who I can't tell you who he solicited. <laughs> right. Discussion on this. Um, so the decision to name is a big decision, and and. It's one that, that we shouldn't take lightly, although you know, I worked with Mr. Day, and I know that, I know that uh, Jim loved working the kids, not kids, and I know that this is more than deserving. I just want to make sure that we have the appropriate conversation before we move forward. Um, you know, we've talked about namings of other things in the past, um, but you know, I, I just want to make sure that we, we talk it all through before we consider a motion here. So is there anybody that has any concern about doing something like this at this point? Because it is a lot, I mean, a lot of the 900 are students, which I think speaks well to how he was accepted in the school. I mean, you'd want to see that. Um, but with that said, any, any reservations about this at all? Um, I have one question. So I know that James Day, like to be called Gym Day, would the preference be the Gym Day Gymnasium? I think that we would need to check with the family on that before we would move forward. Um, say that again? I would say check with the family. Yes. Um, we want to make sure that we, we hit those wishes, um, which would affect the motion because the way the motion is listed out, it would be the James Day Gymnasium, but we would definitely want to check that before we do that. So, I'm gonna do the, the, the master of amendments, Mr. O Mr. Oak. Sure, um, just one comment before uh, a motion. I, w I don't know what happens once this, assuming this motion goes through, what happens next? Do we plan an event around this? Or do we need to be participatory in the planning of said event? Mm -hmm. I would think as the wrestling coach and his ties into wrestling, it probably makes sense for one of the invitationals to maybe have be the unveiling ceremony as opposed to the middle of the football season. But, name, we're naming a gym. So when I said you have any discussion, you said no. Well, now you moved not. right to the motion. <laughs> I just, asked if anybody had anything. And you looked at us. <laughs> Well, because, come on, after they look at him, Sorry, would you, which way are you going to look? <laughs> My thought is that the name would be put on the actual gym floor. You know, as gym, you know, this gym day gymnasium or James day gymnasium it would be painted right on the floor. Um, and the thought is that when the first home wrestling match that takes place, that that would be the unveiling of it. Um, you know, have it covered with paper or whatever before, then have the wrestlers take it off, and that would be how we would, you know, announce that it's now. At that point, it becomes the gym day or James Day Gymnasium. 
but that was a brief conversation with Mr. Mori, um, athletic director, that we had a discussion about that. Okay. So is that, I mean, is that something that we need to kind of worry ourselves about, or does that kind of I think it just fall falls into falls something under, like falls graduation? Under, falls something. under athletic director, um, group set group. up, and then they would notify the board about what was taking place, and then okay. the board could obviously attend if they'd like to at that. Yeah. But the thought was, on the first home wrestling match, you know, we obviously would invite, you know, uh, Jim's wife and, and son Shane, and you know, any other former wrestlers that wanted to be there for that, okay. and kind of make it that big event on the first home wrestling match and fill the gymnasium. Okay. So, <clears throat> first off, is I love the idea. I'm all for it 100. percent Second, I'd be interested to know since we just had this budget conversation about the cost of repainting the gymnasium floor after essentially it's just been done uh, versus some other method. So I, I would like to see some of that. I mean, I, I hate to be that way, but... Yeah, if we're going to get Mr. Morris, of course, the hell with that, we're all for it. Is just I, I just, based the on the thing. previous conversation, we need to... The wrestling community came out in droves for that year. For the funeral, but also to get the names up on the wall. Yeah. I'd be shocked. If they knew, that they knew this was happening, I'd be shocked if they didn't come so. out. I just ask for we'll get to, we'll make sure there's a quote first. That, that you know the we, we, we just we just look at that piece. Yes, we'll make sure there's a quote. But again, all for it, a hundred percent. the wife right now to see James or Jim. Oh, so we stall for a little bit. This. Go ahead, stall for a few minutes. Get a cook. Marie's Um, Master of Ceremonies, can we put this on hold, move to the next agenda item, and then come back to this? Yeah, we can just continue talking. Table it. We don't have to table anything, we just keep talking. I can make all the motions I want before we adjourn. Whether they're related to stuff the on the agenda or not. What so. was the last thing that we made? Was there a precedent recently for changing the name to the field or something? I don't think so. No. I know a lot of the town baseball and softball fields have been named after people, but I didn't know anything in the school system. So. The media center. Except for the media center. center. Yeah, media center. center. Yeah. Yes, because yeah. that's giant letters on the yeah. side. Yeah. 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 Right. And we did talk about renaming uh, the library in Chris Hall, but we did not embrace that. Right. <clears throat> Can we just make a motion that we approve a naming after James Day, which is actually what people signed? On the look at the signatures, it didn't say name it. What the name it? Yeah, we can yeah that's fair. We can do we that. We can go with something like that. So, I move to name the B Gymnasium at the Berlin High School in honor of the late Jim Day. I have a motion. Second. Motion by Tim. Second by Rich. Further discussion. All in favor. Aye. Aye. I have one, two, three, and four. I have five and a absence. <laughs> Jamie's Jamie left the room. Sorry. So Betty's got to do that one. Okay. Next item: motion for fiscal management. So, nope, we don't have to because we're covered. <laughs> All right. So, in the fact that we appointed Jeff tonight, you appointed Jeff tonight, we need to have I'm ready to go on July 1 as to handle the fiscal management, which is the various accounts that we would deal with. So the motion here is just that we wouldn't have to do at the next board meeting, that Jeff would be ready on July 1 to take over that role, um, which means we can hit the ground running, having access to all of the accounts and the authority to access those accounts. And then it looks like license, likewise for Eileen. Yeah, yeah. yeah please, Jeff. Okay, yep. I'll make a motion. Are we ready for that? Or? Yep, fire yep. away. Okay, move that Jeffrey Cookno be designated treasurer of the Berlin High School Enterprise Fund the Berlin Public Schools Activities Fund and the Cafeteria Fund. 
and also that Eileen Eustace replaced Jeffrey Kronk as Assistant Treasurer of the Berlin High School Enterprise Fund, effective July 1st, 2018. I have a motion by Rich. Second. Second by Tim. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And I think that that's everything on our agenda, except one. Move to adjourn. Uh, I have a motion, I have a move, motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? I have a second by Carrie. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned.